and record to the cloud. Perfect. Well, um, first off, I want to welcome everybody to our North Carolina chapter speaker series. I'm really excited to have everyone here joining us today and to learn a little bit more about accessible voting for the visually impaired. So my name is Bailey Bostelman and I am the Director of Chapter Engagement at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And we're excited today to have Bob Warren with us who is a local advocate in the North Carolina area who will be sharing with us some of the ins and outs of accessible online voting for the visual impaired. All the information that is shared today will be available after the call. And we will also include the links to each of the resources that Bob will be sharing with us. The session will also be recorded so that you can revisit or share this information at a later date. But before we get things kicked off with the presentation, I wanted just to take a moment to share a little bit about the Foundation Fighting Blindness for those of you who may not be familiar with what we do. So the Foundation Fighting Blindness was organized to drive research that will provide preventions, treatments, and cures for people affected by retinitis pigmentosa, age-related macular degeneration, Usher syndrome, and the entire spectrum of retinal degenerative diseases. We fund research in the lab, translational research, clinical trials, career development awards, national history, registry, as well as offer free genetic testing. Today, we're the world's leading private funder of retinal disease research, raising $856 million to fund sight-restoring research. So together, we are winning. We're on the edge of curing blinding retinal diseases. So that means no more patients being told their children will become blind, no more young adults being told they will go blind. No more seniors being told their final years will be in the dark. This is the time to be part of the winning team that will help millions of people across the nation. We're currently wait winning thanks to our community of supporters and volunteers and donors, just like many of you on this call. Our family of volunteers and leaders stand up for those impacted by blinding diseases. From day one, they share the latest research and advancements and provide access to local resources to guide individuals through their personal journey. Our vision is to bring the community together to end blinding diseases. One way we are doing that is through the chapter network. Our chapter network focuses on three main areas, education, resources, and revenue. By sharing the latest advancements in research with the local community, by providing access to local resources to guide individuals through their personal journey, as well as by accelerating our mission by participating in our fundraising events and creating new ways to fundraise locally. In North Carolina, we currently have three active chapters, our Triangle Chapter, Triad Chapter, and Charlotte Chapter. There are many different ways to get involved with the foundation. So you can get involved in our mission by volunteering through your local chapter, becoming a chapter leader, joining our professional outreach team, or getting involved in the variety of local events, such as our Triangle Vision Walk that we have coming up this weekend on April 30th. Help us continue to fund sight-saving research by joining our Legacy Society or hosting or participating in a local fundraiser. Another fun way to get involved is by planning a trip to Orlando for our National Visions Conference. So this is a one-of-a-kind event in which individuals who are visually impaired and their families have the opportunity to hear about exciting advancements in blindness research. All attendees can gain practical skills for coping with vision loss, learn about products and services that can improve their lives, and connect with others from across the country. Lastly, we want to make sure that you sign up for My Retina Tracker, which is a research database of people and families affected by rare inherited retinal degenerative diseases. And its goal is to help accelerate the discovery of treatments and cures. By using the data in My Retina Tracker registry, it helps us understand how common each type of retinal disease is and how it impacts people's lives. 
how the disease progresses, and also the genes that are causing the disease. And it helps researchers and companies to effectively find people who might be interested in participating in research studies and clinical trials. So lastly, I just wanna give a quick thank you to our sponsors who help make events like this possible. Just for a few housekeeping things, any questions during the session or for more information on ways to get involved in your area, feel free to send a message in the chat or email us at chapters at fightingblindness.org. We'll also open the floor to questions towards the end of the presentation for anything that you might want to go ahead and talk about um, right away. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and hand the floor over to Bob Warren. Bob's gonna share with us some accessible voting information for the North Carolina area. So Bob, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Bailey. Um, as she says, my name is Bob Warren. I live in uh, the Ch Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm an active member of lots of low vision support groups. My particular eye uh, disease is one of the degenerative retinal diseases uh, that the foundation supports. It's somewhat rare retinoschisis, but in my case, it presents kind of like retinitis pigmentosa, uh, diminished fields and hard to see in low light. The first thing I want to say when, as I'm giving this talk is, is to say that I'm not in any way an election official or election expert, but I have worked on uh, the accessible voting for some time and, and think the information I'm going to present tonight is relatively accurate. But I would urge anyone who has a voting uh, or election question of any kind, reach out to their local board of election. In my experience, those folks are incredibly um, dedicated and, and helpful and um, responsive. So please do that uh, and don't rely on anything I'm saying if you have a question about it. Uh, for the talk, I'll use the term VIP for visually impaired person, and I might use the term AAB for accessible absentee ballot. So as many of you know that there's a primary election which has been delayed a couple times so it's coming up on May 17th and in the in that election depending on where you live you'll be voting for picking the candidate for your party for US House US Senate you'll be picking the candidates uh, to for the general election in November for the general assembly the Senate the House of Representatives at the state level uh, the U.S. Supreme, or sorry, North Carolina Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and, and probably a host of other uh, local uh, positions. And in fact, some, some folks, uh, some towns, uh, because of redistricting issues, had to delay their regular municipal elections from the fall of 2021 uh, to May. So th there's a lot of stuff on the ballot, and um, it, it's in preparation for the very uh, important election in November of 2022. So the goals of my talk are first and foremost to make people aware of the new method of voting absentee online as opposed to in person or by, by mail, et cetera. And if there's time, I can talk about other, if there's time and questions, I can talk about some of the other ways that uh, VIP folks can vote that already exist that have um, Good, good aspects and less good aspects. So, uh, so some quick background on where did this ability to um, cast an absentee ballot online come from in North Carolina? Well, in 2020, a lawsuit was filed by the local chapter in Raleigh of the American Council of the Blind, and in conjunction with an advocacy group called Disability Rights North Carolina. Uh, the, the uh, lawsuit alleged that VIP folks uh, don't have the ability to cast their votes both privately and independently as all other voters do. And um, it, as part of the suit, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the lawyers that was involved made the estimate, uh, and it's a big number, that there's something on the order of 150,000 North Carolina voters who are not able to mark their uh, by mail uh, ballots uh, 
uh, privately. They, they need help or, or whatever. So that's a big number. So in the fall of 2020, the judge in the suit issued a temporary order, which uh, mandated that the state had to provide a method for uh, VIP voters to be able to vote um, in a private and independent way. And, and what was chosen to be to do is that North Carolina had recently added a capability for their military and overseas voters to, to vote online. And so the judge essentially said, open that up to the, to the visually impaired. Um, but because it was late in the late in the October or September when the order was put out, the, uh, the state complied, but there was only about two weeks before the 2020 election. Um, and I was able to be part of the, the testing process and they actually did have it up and running, but very few people used it because very few people knew about it and it had, it had issues. Um, the, the judge's order is still in effect and hence the uh, 2021 municipal elections, uh, you were able to use the online uh, option. I did in fact, and it's gonna be available of course for um, May, the May 17 primary and the November general election. Um, so the, the, I got interested in this because I think it's a, an issue of fairness and, and I have a bit of a technical background and I'm good at you know, methodical testing of things. So in the fall of 2021, I spent a lot of time uh, going through the um, accessible absentee ballot process and, and making notes of places where I thought it was confusing or didn't work as smoothly as it could. And I, I made contact with an extremely helpful person out of the Orange County uh, Board of Election. And um, she helped me put together uh, a list of my comments and suggestions and got them to the right folks. And in fact, a, a good number of things were changed and improved. Uh, there's more to go. And, and frankly, part of the reason of giving the talk and getting people interested in, in this for the May 17th primary is so that more people will try out the system and report any issues that can then be uh, worked on and, and made uh, better so that the November election, the, the one where lots of people come out to vote, will run more smoothly for those people who want to use this accessible um, ballot. Uh, and the other thing is the state, they're trying and I keep pushing them, but they've done not a whole lot in a big way to publicize the availability of this new method of voting. So that's in part while I'm, why I'm having this talk and I I've done some other things as well. So moving on, and hopefully I'm not going too fast or, or, or whatever. Any feedback on that regard? No, I think this is perfect. Okay. Um, so just, uh, just as a recap, there's already quite a few ways for visually impaired folks to, to, to vote um, that have been there for some time. You can vote in person with a, the help of your spouse or partner or a friend. You can vote in person with the help of, of a um, nonpartisan election official if you want to. You can vote in person with a so-called ballot marking device. And the most common one is a device some, some people have, may have heard of called the AutoMark. And we'll talk more about the AutoMark uh, ballot marking device later in the, in the talk if there's time. You can talk you can uh, vote in person with something called curbside voting, uh, which is uh, I've never done, but a number of people I know do that where you drive up to a designated spot and an election official brings a ballot, you fill it out and they take it back in. And then uh, if you're in a nursing home, there's a, a fairly complex set of rules about who can help you uh, voting. There's, uh, you can't get the nursing home staff in general to help you, but they're this, there's a, a special organ, a special set of people who call, um, they're called multi-partisan um, assistance team, M-A-T. Yeah. <laughs> they get, the voting really gets into the weeds, but that is available. The problem is that all of the above um, options, which, which are good, and a lot of people vote those ways, uh, with the exception possibly of the ballot marking device, uh, are in general don't allow you to vote privately and or independently. 
at least not easily. So the new method is like you re like regular folks request to get a paper ballot to vote absentee, you can now ask to be able to use the an online accessible ballot. You have to uh, request that ballot. You're approved. You get a a uh, you give them an email. They look you up. They uh, send you back approval to use the system. And at that point, you proceed with voting on the accessible ballot. You mark it, you review it, and you submit it. I'll go into we'll be going into more detail about it all. But that's that's and all of that can be done from uh, your home on your computer, on your iPad or Android device, whatever, whatever you got. I should say a word about registering to vote. You can't do any of this unless you're actually registered to vote in North Carolina. It turns out that the uh, deadline to submit a, uh, your registration to vote uh, passed just a couple of days ago, but it appears that if you go to early voting, there are mechanisms for registering uh, before the May 17th primary. Again, call your local uh, board of election for help with that. So let's talk about the, the, the process. What North Carolina has set up is something they call the North Carolina Absentee Ballot Portal. And this is the key, this is the key starting point for all, all of this that I'm gonna talk about. It's actually the starting point for anyone who wants to vote absentee, whether it's by you know, a paper ballot by mail or the online uh, version. And by the way, I, I haven't laced the talk with a whole lot of uh, complicated URLs, but at the end, I have a, a, a slide or Bailey will show a slide that has quite a few of those kind of URLs. And that would be the kind of thing people might wanna get by email. Uh, to use. Anyway, the, the portal, it's a web portal. It has several options. One option is to re, for people for the purpose of this talk is to request to use the accessible absentee ballot. Option two is, is uh, reserved for folks in the military or overseas. They have slightly different rules for voting, so we won't go talk about that anymore. Option three on that page once you've reg or requested to use the ballot and have been approved and gotten your email, option three allows you to actually get to the ballot marking process. And then abs option four um, gives you the chance uh, close to a, a, an election when, when the candidates are, are known, you can actually get a sample ballot to look at before, before you go to vote. So let's talk about the... Um, how you request to use the, the ballot, the accessible ballot. Uh, as I say, you start out at the portal, you select option one, you provide uh, information about yourself. That, that entails your first last name, uh, date of birth, which has separate fields for the month, day and year. Uh, you can type those in if you can do that, or it has drop downs where you have to scroll about to pick your birthday. Um, in, in principle, these, these uh, uh, fields are, work well with screen readers, but in part, part of, the, part of my goal is to have people use this process and report any issues along those lines. Finally, you, uh, you have to tell them which county you currently reside in. Um, and that using that information, they take you to the next page where you have to provide either your uh, DMV license uh, number or state ID number in my case, or you can provide the last four digits of your social security number. And with all that information, basically the system looks you up and, um, and confirms that uh, based on the information you provided that you're, you're, in, um, you're now able to get to the point of requesting um, an absentee ballot. And by the way, if, if you get to, through that and the system says it doesn't recognize you, well, there could be some issue with how the state has your information. If um, some of you may have heard of the issues down in Texas where similar kind of information, uh, driver's license number or last four social security and so forth have been re recently required. And, and a lot of people 
didn't have the right information or they had the right information, I should say, but the state didn't have the right information. And so their ballot was uh, rejected. Um, so it's a good, this is a good opportunity to make sure that your proper information is, is on file. And so it's a good plan to not wait till the last minute if you're gonna do this in case there are issues. So to be fair, the, the trickiest part of the whole process is doing the request form. And um, there's a lot of, when you get to the request form, there's a, it's a web form. It's got about two full pages of, uh, of uh, text that explains all the sections you have to you know wade through all that especially if you have a screen reader it could take a bit but once you get down to the actual uh, form you um, some of the information you've already given is filled in the form will one confusing part is the form's going to ask you for your physical mailing address even though you're not going to be mailed a paper ballot you're going to be uh, emailed the authorization to use the online ballot um, and one of the sections section six is pretty key and and potentially easy to overlook. It's, it basically has two check boxes, the second of which basically, if you check it, you're, you're saying that you're a visually impaired person and would like to vote with the accessible ballot. There's, uh, there's a spurt, the first check box will allow you, if you check it, to say, I'd like to do this, this for any upcoming elections. So that's a useful box as well. Eventually, you get to the point where you have to sign this request form. And again, it gets if a paper ballot you would sign, you know, as best you could. But with the online ballot, you have the choice, several choices um, or two choices, really. If you're doing all this on a touch screen, you can use your, your finger to, to do your best at writing your name. Or if you are on a regular computer with a mouse, you can hold down the mouse button and attempt to uh, write your name that way. Having, um, having done that a few times, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging to <laughs> make something that looks as you know, like your signature. But um, I guess there's a final, if you really are incapable of doing either of those things, if you make just some kind of a mark, uh, they'll, the state will accept that request. Um, you can have assistance. Um, somebody to help you with the process. If, if you do, they need to put their name down and so forth. So having said all this, and uh, this was the main uh, form that I sent lots of comments and, and hopeful clarification ways that the form could be made better, not all of which unfortunately were adopted, uh, but some were. My re if, you're, if you get to this point and you have trouble, um, my recommendation would be to, if you're okay with that and ha have the opportunity to do is just get somebody who's cited to help you navigate some of the trickier parts. That, that kind of would be my, because um, I, I, I'd hate to see people get put off by the whole thing because they couldn't get past the request process. Well, the, the trick here is this, this form must be uh, submitted by five o'clock one week before election day. So you have to actually request either a paper ballot or the use the online ballot by five o'clock on May 10th. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so I'll get, get to another, um, another aspect of the process that, that people need to understand going into it because it's, it, it, may, it may be a problem for some. Uh, it can be worked around, but the issue is that um, you anybody who fills out an absentee ballot, whether it be on paper or via the online uh, uh, option, has to have two witnesses. Uh, the witnesses have to observe you uh, doing the process, either by, by paper or online. They do not and should not be close enough to you to figure out, you know, to see what you're voting ab about. The, the trick is that back in 2020, the uh, state legislature, uh, because of the pandemic, relaxed the two witness rule down to one witness. But here in 2021 and going forward, they've reinstated the two witness requirement. And um, I personally think that can be a real 
challenge for some who may have, you know, a partner who can help them, but it may be challenging for them to get someone else to come in and be a witness. You can take your portable device with you and go, you know, go find friends or whatever, but not everybody has a portable device. Um, the, the, the screen real estate's smaller to do this, so it will work on an iPhone. So if you, if you think this is a bit of an issue, um, I would um, uh, uh, contact your, your congressman. This is out of the control of the Board of Elections. They follow what the state legislature sets as rules. So while you're waiting, by the way, uh, as I said before, while you're waiting after you put in your request form, you can look at a sample ballot that is pretty close to what you'll be uh, voting on by going back to the portal and going into option four down there, identifying who you are, and in this case, just the county you are in, and, and you'll be able to get a uh, page that lists all the candidates for all the races. You can actually, and this isn't how the voting works, but you can actually check off the ones you think you'd like to vote for and print out that page as, as a reference. So that's something uh, good to do um, before, before it's actually time to do the voting. All right, so we've, uh, at this point in the process, you've requested to vote with the accessible ballot. So that request goes to, within each county, it goes to a particular person for on each of the board of elections for the 100 counties in North Carolina. And they essentially using the information on the form and your email address within a day or two will send you an email essentially saying, okay, you can now vote the accessible ballot. If by chance you don't hear back within a couple of days, again, call your local board of election, not the state board of election, but your county's local board of election. In the URLs I'm gonna provide later, there's um, information on how you actually find the phone number and location and all of that information about your board of election. <clears throat> so, um, so at that point you start, you start the process and it's, it's much like what you've already done. You go back to the uh, portal, this time you check out or select option three, you identify yourself as before. Again, it'll require you to have your, your first, last name, birthday, county. Uh, at next part, it'll ask you for your DMV or state ID or your four digits. And at this point, if, if it fails, it's probably the case that um, you've entered something incorrectly, maybe just a typo. That actually happened to me today. I didn't, I didn't do the, quite the right, the right thing. Um, but again, if you have trouble, call your uh, state board of election. So now you're actually doing the process, okay? Um, again, as you get into the thing, there's a whole bunch of instructions, a couple of pages worth that describe the process and so forth. Um, you can review these uh, and continue. And at that point, you've actually, believe it or not, gotten to where you can actually mark your ballot, <laughs> okay? All of this sounds pretty challenging, but it, it, it really uh, only takes a couple of minutes once you get the hang of it to get, to get through this, maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes. So at this point, you get to the actual place where you mark your ballot. And I'll go into more detail about that because the reality is marking the ballot is, is actually the, the easiest, most straightforward part of the whole process. And I'll talk about why that is. So you mark your ballot, you review your ballot choices, you uh, fill out the name and address of your, um, of your uh, two witnesses, you uh, fill out the name of any, um, a uh, helper that you've had, anybody can help you, your, your spouse. And by the way, a helper can also be one of the witnesses if, if that's useful to you. You, uh, you have your uh, wit, let's see, you sign your name using the mouse or your finger, or in this case, you, there's an option to actually type your name in as opposed to trying to you know sign it uh, with your finger or the mouse. You have your witness one sign, your witness two sign. Um, again, if, if necessary, they can type in their, their name as opposed to using the, their mouse or finger. 
you have to then review and uh, there's a review page and, and it, it's a little counterintuitive, but you have to actually review what they call your, your ballot package, which has a sheet with your name and address and all of that. And then, and then, uh, and close that. You have the option of fixing things, of course. And then you have to actually, again, review your ballot choices. And unless you at least click on those things and then dismiss the page, and it's pretty easy to do that, um, you won't be able to submit your ballot. So that's one of the, one of the gotchas. So once you've submitted your ballot, then you'll get a page that says successful submission. But what you won't get, at least not then, is any email that says you've, you've, uh, you've done the process. What will happen is that your ballot will again go to, it's distributed out to a, a designated person at each one of the hundred um, county boards of election. And that person's job is to uh, uh, you know, take your ballot package and uh, process it further um, without going into a lot of detail. The end product is your information is, is put onto a ballot like anybody else would have filled out and run through the tabulator. The process is um, checked by multiple people. Uh, it, it's, it, it works pretty well, but it takes a couple of days. But most of the um, people that processed your absentee ballot will in fact, <clears throat> as a courtesy, send you a email saying your ballot's been put through the system. Um, I, I listed a few gotchas here. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the continue button is on the left, sometimes on the right, sometimes in the middle. So just keep up with that. Um, there, there's some, it can be a little challenging when you first encounter the click to sign because there, there's an X where you can use your mouse or finger, but below that there's a box. If you're okay with typing your name in, you type it in there. And uh, so real quick on actually marking the ballot. You know, I've talked about the whole process. And as I said, the actual marking of the ballot is, is extremely, um, a lot of engineering, a lot of work has gone into making that process very easy to do, very intuitive. Um, it, this part of the process was designed and implemented by a company called Democracy Live. And this, this online capability uh, they've been working on testing, having it evaluated, reviewed, debugged for over 10 years now. So the process goes very smoothly. Um, the, uh, the code is, it supports almost any operating system, any browser, uh, almost all um, well-known screen readers. It allows every race you see the candidates. It's easy to select the one you want to go back and unselect it. Uh, if you change your mind, you can add a write-in candidate if, if you want to do that. If you forget a race, if you fail to um, vote for somebody on one of the races, it will warn you. Now you can click through that. You can just decide I'm not going to vote for anybody, but it won't let you, for example, vote Two time, two, for two different people in a race where only one, you, you only have the choice of one. By the same token, if there's a, if there's a board of um, a, education where you can pick two out of the eight candidates and you only pick one, it'll warn you about that as well and give you the opportunity to, to fix that. So that's, that's kind of nice. I mean, you don't always have that capability when you're filling out a paper ballot. You, it, it's much more... Uh, potentially easy to make mistakes like that, which might lead to your, your uh, ballot being invalidated. So having these checks, in my view, is a real, uh, a real in, uh, win for the online, uh, <clears throat> online ser service. If, if there are referendum in, on your ballot, you know, water bonds or whatever they might be, those are all uh, uh, put out there and, and gives you the option of uh, voting for them or against them. So I've talked about a whole lot of stuff. I'm sure it seems a little overwhelming, so many different pages and things to remember. But what I, what, what fortunately, uh, what the state has done is in addition to their regular uh, portal for absentee ballot um, processing, they have a demo portal. And 
you can't, you, there's no demo for the requesting to use the thing, but you can, uh, you can fill out the, go through the entire process of actually accessing an absent, an accessible ballot, voting it, submitting it, and the whole thing. It's, it's all with um, demo information. So that's uh, in option three back at the main portal. And if you read option three carefully, you'll come across the link that says here. And if you click on that, that's a place you can, you'll get to the demo portal and that's a place you can practice the entire process. Uh, Tim O'Brien today uh, helped me out by testing it out and said he had a pretty smooth time except for a, a, a unexpected issue that we're gonna get fixed. So that's essentially- yeah, just to Go ahead, just to chime in, Bob asked me to do that today, and I use uh, Zoom text with uh, the screen reader part of Zoom text, and it works great. So thank that's you, Bob. great, Tim. So here I'm at the end of my prepared talk. Uh, I have I can talk more about some of the other uh, ways to uh, to vote if people are interested. In particular, maybe I could with some time I could talk a little bit about the ballot marking. Uh, devices, perhaps not everyone knows about them or has used them. But before I do that, part of the, uh, part of the main reason I wanted to give this talk is to get the information out to people. And even if you think you would rather just, you know, go in with your wife or husband and vote or a friend or, you know, uh, what I'm hoping I can get people to do <clears throat> Is it is to give the accessible ballot a, a try, at least the demo part of it. You don't have to request the absent the um, ballot to use the demo part. And again, if you if you use it and your combination of uh, of uh, screen reader and browser, if you run into any trouble, I um, I would like you to let the, your local board of election know, or I'd be happy if you let me know and I'll make sure that your issue gets uh, raised. Because again, part of the goal is to get the process to run as, as well and smoothly as it can by the time of the um, May uh, 7, uh, the November election. One other point I'll make is, let's say you decide, hey, I'd like to give this uh, accessible ballot a try and you request to use the online accessible ballot. If you get start using it and you decide it's not for you, just don't don't get to the part where you submit it. Just stop and go and vote some other way. You, once you, even if you request to use uh, um, a paper absentee ballot, an online absentee ballot, if you don't actually you know fill it out and and submit it, then you can go and vote any other uh, method that you like. No no problem. The other ask of of everybody. Um, uh, it may, it is if you're in the triangle, and I'm not sure if you can see, but I've got my Vision Walk uh, t-shirt on here from previous years. As Bailey said, the walk is this coming uh, Saturday from 9.30 to 12 in Pullen Park in Raleigh. It's a great event. There's a lot of fun stuff that goes on besides just the walking part. There's uh, information tables, there's food, there's music, there are prizes, there's dance contests. Uh, and it's like any walk, you know, you, the goal is to have people sponsor you and, and, and uh, make contributions to the foundation for the excellent work they do. You, you can register ahead, but even if you just show up, you'll, uh, it'll be fine. So come on out. Um, it, it'll be a great, a great time. Hey, Bob. Yeah. So um, I had a question about something um, you mentioned earlier, and I'm sorry if I'm reading too much into this, but you mentioned specific um, voting dates that this would be available. Is that because those are just the next few that this would apply to, or was the was the judge's order only for like a like a temporary time period or just a trial period, and that will have to be renewed? or is this permanent? The judge's order is still in effect and will be in effect. What, what's, what's happening is the legislature, there's a bill on the, in the legislature to codify uh, the accessible balloting option as part and parcel of the regular 
uh, voting uh, law, set of laws. It, unless something's changed, that bill, you know, the legislature isn't in session all the time. But hopefully that bill, there, there's a draft of it. You can go out and read it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not quite sure why they haven't uh, passed the, the thing yet, but it, it, as long as the judge's order is in effect, and, and I have every confidence it'll stay in effect uh, as long as, as necessary until, until North Carolina adds so the, the law to the books. Uh, so yes, May 17th will, will be, uh, is certainly, uh, it's available for, it'll be available for, for November and going forward. The judge was quite uh, adamant about uh, uh, making voting more accessible for visually impaired folks. As they should be. Okay, so that's terribly helpful. We just have to wait for the legislation to um, make it permanent, which I'm sure right. will happen eventually. Okay, thank you. So, uh, and thanks and for the, um, promoting Vision Walk too. Absolutely. Hope to see everybody there on Saturday. So, um, one of the handouts that Bailey may put up later or as soon as, is I have a list of what I call important dates. And um, and so in particular, real quick, actually in-person uh, voting, early voting starts tomorrow. And it, you know, the time is gonna depend on which county you're in and which polling plate or early voting site you go to. Again, in, in a list of URLs, there's, there's a way that you can find out where your early voting sites are and what their hours are and all of that. Or if you don't want to hunt through their website, again, just call up your local board of election and they can tell you all of that. Um, let's see. The, as I said, the uh, absentee ballot request deadline, and that's for either paper or to use the online version, is uh, five o'clock on May 10th. You have to at least request it. And that, if you wait that long for a paper ballot, you may not, you may not be, uh, be able to do it with the way mail is you know, U.S. mail is working. In-person uh, early voting ends on May 14th. Um, I think that's a Saturday and at 3 p.m. So you've got a, about two weeks to, a little over two weeks to go to early voting if you choose to do that. Election day is uh, May 17th. And then absentee ballots are due. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, caveats about this. The simple version is absentee ballots are due by 5 p.m. on election day. And that, that's strictly true if you are gonna use the online ballot. You need to work through it and hit the submit button before five o'clock on, on election day. If you, um, but if you voted with a paper ballot, you can actually take the paper ballot not to, not to your local election day polling place, but you can actually, if you're at this much of a last minute person, you can take it to your county board of election, which in our case in Orange County is way up to Hillsborough. Or, um, and you can't drop them off if you say, oh, I'll just take it to the, my local polling place. You can't drop off an absentee ballot there. Uh, on the other hand, you could tear it up and vote in person on election day. The fact that you filled it out, as long as you don't submit it, you're good to go. And then finally, and this is always a source of some controversy, if you get your paper absentee ballot postmarked by 5 p.m. on May 17th, election day, it has, it has until 5 p.m. Uh, on May, what it would be 20th, the Friday to, to, be, uh, to come in to uh, be counted. After that, it won't be counted. <clears throat> So any other questions for, for me? Bob, this is Bailey. So, and, and I'm, you may know this, you may not, because it's kind of outside of the North Carolina realm, but is this something that other states do as well, is offer accessible voting, or is this something that North Carolina is kind of piloting right now in terms of different areas? That's a really good question. I'm, I'm certainly not, I don't know all the ins and outs, but North Carolina is one of only a, a relatively few states that allows um, accessible online uh, voting for the visually impaired. <clears throat> one, uh, California allows uh, the visually impaired to, to 
vote online, but unless they've changed it, their system requires that once you've you know, filled out the ballot uh, using the, the process like I described, they use the Democracy Live software as well. You as the voter have to print out on your local printer, your ballot, put it in an envelope and mail it in. So North Carolina doesn't require you to do that. Now there, there I think um, it might be Maryland. There, there's a, 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 a growing number of states who have recognized the need for at least the visually impaired to be able to do this. Other states I think are toying, uh, maybe Washington state. I, I think it may be possible for to use accessible, not accessible, but just anybody to vote absentee. There's a lot of concern. I mean, in fairness, you know, um, uh, opening it up to such uh, everyone gives some people um, uh, pause, but from the point of view of folks that really need this kind of service and aren't really overwhelming the, uh, the voting process, I think it's uh, going to be rolled out to more states as, as time goes on. But the short version is yes, North Carolina is doing a great job of making this available to its visually impaired um, voters. That's fantastic. And, and and I was surprised, I know that you had mentioned it earlier, just the number of visually impaired folks in the North Carolina area. So this really could have a have a large impact on, on those in the community. Well, <clears throat> You know, I didn't independently verify the number that the uh, the lawyer came up with, 150,000 as part of this lawsuit. But I'm not. I mean, there's supposed to be something on the order of 250 or more thousand people with significant visual uh, impairments in our state. So 150,000 possible voters is not out of you know doesn't strike me as is uh, implausible. Now, not all of those folks might be you know registered to vote or choose to vote, et cetera. But even so, it's a, it's a big number. Um, and in part, that's partly why I'm interested in, in adding that this as an option for people who might otherwise, it might be too tough to actually get to a polling place or fill out a ballot by mail or whatever. Um, if no other questions, and, and I know this is being recorded, if it's okay, I'd like to at least make a few comments about another uh, 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 way that the visually impaired can vote. And this, this mechanism has been around for quite a while. It's called the um, ballot marking device. And for most of the 100 counties, that ballot marking device is called the auto mark. And uh, some of you uh, in the audience may have used it. I've used it. The idea is it's a, it's a standalone device that by law, every polling place in the whole United States has to have one of which. And uh, it's, they differ in, in a way by uh, how they work, but the auto mark, basically you, uh, you put a ballot where the election official puts a blank ballot into the, the machine. And the machine has a, a large uh, monitor that uh, has a, a touch screen capability. Uh, next to the machine is a keypad that allows you to use that to navigate through uh, different aspects and different pages that you see on the screen. It also has a, a voice that uh, with headphones, an audio capability that will read every, if you're you know, completely blind, it will read every race, every candidate and help you navigate, you know, help make sure that when you mark who you want that you've marked the proper thing. So it's quite a, you know, it's a, a, a really uh, interesting device. It allows you to vote all the races. It'll give you some feedback. Again, if you haven't, if you've left off uh, a race, haven't voted for someone, it'll tell you if you voted for too many people. It, in, a, in a way, it's a little bit like the, the uh, online ballot marking software instantiated in this, um, in this device. When, when, it, when everything's done and you're happy with your choices, the machine is a printer and it, it will print on the standard um, ballot your choices, at which point you or somebody to help you will take your um, ballot, which has been 
selected by you, but physically marked by the machine and you put it in the tabulator just like anybody else, get your I voted sticker and off you go. So in principle, the uh, ballot marking devices are really a nice approach, but the reality is, and, and this isn't just me, it's uh, whenever this topic comes up in, in various blind low vision support groups, and we talked, we, we had one recently, we talked to the Orange County folks, people have run into all kinds of issues with the things. Often they'll get to a polling place and the device isn't even plugged in, or it's not, you know, it's not set up to, uh, yet. It doesn't have its uh, uh, headphones with it, though you can bring your own headphones if you like. Um, another issue is sometimes the screen is turned in such a way that anybody walking near you could see exactly how you're voting and hence it's not private. Might be, you might be doing it independently, but it's not private. Um, and uh, in, in many, many of the um, locations, the, the election officials really don't know how the machine works. I mean, some do, but many don't. And finally, I even heard of this issue that uh, somebody's uh, auto mark, they were getting ready to print out the ballot and the machine was out of ink. So th these machines, when they're set up properly and people can help you use them, they're great. And they're a good way to vote. I've used them several times um, in, in Orange County, the, the voting place I go, it does an excellent job in uh, setting up and, and helping people with the auto mark, but that's not the case uh, uh, all around. And, it, and, and, and by the way, if, if you do choose to use the auto mark at your polling location, wherever it might be in North Carolina, and you run into trouble, please, 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 you know, they'll help you as best they can, but at some point, please let, again, let your local board of elections know of the kind of issue you have, because by law, this, these machines are put there for folks that can't vote without uh, a help like the machine gives you. So I'll uh, get off my soapbox on that for a while. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk today. And any other questions or, uh, um, let me just say, um, as I said, Bailey will uh, make available both a list of the relevant dates for voting and also a, 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 a handout that has a good number of uh, URLs for things like finding where your polling place is, finding how to contact your local board of election. The first URLs are, are there's one that has a nice overview of how the accessible Voting works. There's a link to the uh, standard portal, to the demo portal. Um, there's uh, information on how to check your voter registration status. There's there's a whole lot of stuff available uh, about voting out on on the North Carolina um, State Board of Elections uh, website. And finally, as I said, if, if anybody listening to this needs more information or has questions or wants to report problems, please contact me. My email address is Bob Warren, altogether, B O B W A R R E N, at NC, like the state, dot R R dot com. And thank you and thank Bailey and come on out to the Vision Walk. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Bob. And if you're okay with it, I'll make sure to include your email and the follow up with the information. That way folks have it as well. But we really appreciate everyone spending their evening with us. And this was great information, Bob. And I'm, I'm excited to get some more accessibility tools out there for our voters and help ease the process a little bit. And um, yes, definitely plan to come out to Vision Walk this weekend. We hope to see everyone there. I know that um, our crew will all be in full force. I know that Bob and all of um, Tim and Christy and all of our other chapter leaders are going to be out there as well. So thank you all again and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Rob. Bye-bye. Sure, Tim.